So welcome to the session, Critical Challenges in Modelling Past and Future Evolution of the Antarctic and Greenland Ice Sheets, Scales, Uncertainty, Processes, Implications and Sea Level. My name is Felicity McCormack. I'm a, a senior lecturer at Monash University and I'm convening this session with Chen Zhao, who's a research, Antarctic Research Fellow from the University of Tasmania. It's great to see you all virtually. I'm very much looking forward to this session. I've got a few housekeeping things to go through and then I'll hand over to Chen who'll be introducing um, just how the speakers are going to be running. So first of all, this is the first of two different time slots under this session. The other one is on Tuesday the 9th of August from 1300 to 1500 UTC. So do check out that session as well if it's in a convenient time zone for you. Um, and if it's not in a convenient time zone for you, then you will be able to watch it later. So all sessions will be recorded and the recordings will be made available to uh, registered participants in the past events section of the conference platform and on SCAR's YouTube channel. Now, if you are presenting in this session today and you don't want your presentation to be made publicly available on YouTube, um, please do contact SCAR by the 12th of August. You should have received an email about that um, earlier. Now, there are also e-posters associated with this session, so I'd really encourage everyone to check out those e-posters. Um, they're in the e-poster ex e exhibition space on the events platform. And I'll hand over to Chen now. Thanks, Chen. Thanks, Felicity, um, and welcome again. Uh, every speaker today will have 15 minutes for each of the talk. It includes 12 minutes for their um, presentation, and we will have three minutes for the Q&A session, question and answers. And at the end of this whole time slot, we may have another 10 minutes for questions if you still have questions for all of these printers. And our first speaker is Shiyas uh, Gagwat. He will give us a talk about Cicopolis AD version 2 inverse modeling framework for ice sheet modeling enabled by automatic differentiation. Shiraz, it's all yours now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shen. Uh, I cannot seem to turn on my camera, but I think I can share my slides. Uh, so I'm just going to do that. Uh, can you see my slides now? Yes, yes, I can see okay. it now. Oh, oh sorry, perfect. I forgot to mention you another thing. I will uh, send a reminder once you have two minutes left or one minute left, you will see something like this. Uh, Got it. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shen and Felicity. Uh, I'll just get started. So I'm going to present present on Sicopolis AD V2. It's, an, uh, it's a new inverse modeling framework for ice sheet modeling and it is enabled by an open source automatic differentiation tool, Tapenard. I'd like to start by acknowledging my collaborators, Laura Hascott, Krishna, Liz Curry Logan, Ralph Grieve, who is the developer of the Sicopolis ice sheet model, and Patrick Heimbach, my advisor. I'm presenting uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, so I'm going to start by describing the big picture. The big picture is that climate change is a great icebreaker. And scientifically speaking, the question is how do we estimate sea level rise better? And on the right, I'm showing a plot from the uh, ISMEP-6 Antarctica projections. And the issues that are generally faced by most of the ice sheet models are ad hoc initializations or partially ad hoc surface forcings. And sometimes they, they initialize from a snapshot that is in agreement with the current configuration, but then the, the, the projection suffer from the model drift, which is some kind of model bias that gets induced over the time of a simulation. And so to improve the simulations, we, try, we can use recently collected data from paleoclimate proxies, ice cores, et cetera. And the solution is to calibrate these models to be in harmony with the past flow history by performing data assimilation that is consistent with physics. Uh, and physics here being PD, uh, partial differential equations. So I'm going, I'm going to start by describing the forward model Sicopolis. It is, its full form is simulation code for polythermal ice sheets. It is developed to simulate the evolution of large ice sheets and ice caps, uh, such as Greenland, Antarctica, and even Martian ice caps. Uh, it is a finite differences Fortran 90 code 
uh, and it employs the shallow ice and shallow shelf approximations, which make it suitable for long time scale simulations and which also makes it well suited for paleo simulations. Uh, and Tappenard, this is an automatic differentiation tool. So people who are familiar with machine learning can relate this to being something like PyTorch or TensorFlow or Autograd, but this has been developed for Fortran code. So it sort of differentiates any Fortran code. Uh, uh, once you provide Tappenard a list of inputs and outputs, and then it will differentiate the outputs with respect to the inputs. And we are going to discuss shortly why this is useful. Uh, so imagine you have this PD based ice sheet model, PD meaning partial differential equations. It has some input X and output Y. You discretize this model. You have your discretized Fortran code now. And the inputs are discretized as well. Inputs could include geothermal heat flux, sliding coefficients, surface forcings, and some other model parameters that are not really calibrated. And the output is generally some quantity of interest, for example, sea level rise. The question that arises is how sensitive is the quantity of interest to changes in the inputs? Or what is the gradient of the quantity of interest YD with respect to the discretized input XD? And there are multiple ways to calculate this gradient. The first one is brute force. You could put up one XT at a time and see how YD changes every single time. The second method is tangent linear mode. You could calculate the gradient and, and linearize forward solves. So if you have a model, you can linearize the model and then uh, compute the gradient by providing a direction vector and then computing one direction of the gradient at a time. And this takes n solves. The advantage is that it is faster than the brute force and it is extremely useful for fast uncertainty quantification. Uh, and the finally, the adjoint mode, which is the key takeaway from the stock, it is to calculate the gradient in one single reverse solve using the linearized adjoint model. Adjoint, you can think of the adjoint model as being the transpose operator. The advantages are that it has ex Tappenard generates extremely efficient derivative operators that saves orders of magnitudes of time for deriving this gradient, which I'll show. I will show the results in uh, in one of the next slides. Uh, I'm going to try to explain the adjoint model a little bit better by drawing parallels with machine learning. So this is a neural network. Uh, I'm hoping that more people will be familiar with machine learning, which is why I'm trying to draw a parallel. So for example, this is a neural network. It has some inputs, some outputs, and then the outputs are used to de define a loss function. Uh, generally, uh, once you define the loss function, you will try to use this loss function to define some kind of a gradient, which will be used to tune the weights of the neural network. Uh, and in some kind of a gradient based optimization method. So what we are trying to do is similar, but instead of a neural network, we have a time stepping ice sheet model. We have some inputs, we have some outputs, and these outputs are used to define some cost function not necessarily a loss function, it could be total volume or something else. And we are trying to infer or calibrate the parameters of our uh, ice sheet model. So the cost function can look like some cost function plus some Lagrange multiplies time the model itself. We are trying to constrain the loss function with the model. And this is our model. Uh, L is the operator that steps the model forward in time. And so what the adjoint model does is sort of takes the gradient of this loss function with respect to whatever control parameter was specified to top and out. This is just like back, prop back propagation in machine learning. Uh, it is almost equivalent. And so this has multiple uses. For example, you could use the gradient for sensitivity analysis to evaluate the sensitivity of objective functions to model forcings, quantify which are the most important or most impactful inputs that you should be focusing your model calibration efforts on. You could solve inverse problems with this. For example, if the objective function is some kind of a regularized data misfit function, we could try to minimize this data misfit by having an, a PD constraint inverse problem where we try to calibrate our model parameters so that this data misfit is reduced. And the gradient is of course evaluated again by using the adjoint code that is generated, generated by the AD tool Tappenard. Uh, furthermore, once you have your calibrated parameters, you, could, you would probably want to infer what, how uncertain is your calibration? Like what are the 
quantify some uncertainties around these optimal set of parameters. And even that is made possible by this tool. The gradient of the parameter to observable map is useful in this case in propagating the uncertainties from the data to the quantities of interest or filtered by the PD based forward model. And lastly, you could also use this for optimal experimental design. For example, you could ask the question that where should we place our sensors or drill the next ice core to best inform our decisions, uh, which would, uh, this involves defining some kind of uh, mag, uh, maximum information metric. You define some metric that, that uh, quantifies the information and then you try to maximize the metric. So just to show some results, uh, uh, I'm showing the three different methods used for gradient calculation. And this plot shows that all three of them are equivalent, essentially. Uh, uh, the final differences is the brute force. Uh, adjoint is adjoint and tan TLM means the tangent linear mode, which means the linearized forward, forward one. And uh, as you can see, the adjoint and the tangent linear mode agree almost ident they're almost identical to each other. The error is super small. Uh, although with the finite differences, there is some discrepancy, but uh, we assume that the finite differences is like the true, true result. Uh, but where the adjoint really shines is in the time taken to calculate the gradient. For example, the finite differences took two more, no, this is more than 2.5 days. Uh, the tangent linear mode takes roughly 1.5 days. And the adjoint model only takes 15 seconds to calculate the gradient in the same time. Uh, and this is for a 40 kilometer mesh for which this plot was uh, shown. Uh, if you made the mesh finer, finer differences at tangent linear mode would scale, scale even more poorly because they both require uh, n model runs, uh, order of n model runs, and being the dimension of the parameter space, which is generally proportional to the mesh size. But the adjoint model always evaluates the gradient in one single backward run. And so it always scales better for finer meshes. And thank you. This is the documentation of the code we have developed, uh, the code itself. And we have submitted the code to the Journal of Open Source Software. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shiraz. Uh, do we have any questions for Shiraz? For all the attendees, feel free to drop your questions in the chat if you have any questions for Shiraz or the other speakers. Okay. Yeah, Felicity. <laughs> Thanks, Shiraz. That was a really great talk. Um, I'm really interested in the capability of um, the AD with the optimal experimental design that you mentioned. That sounds like a really innovative um, approach. Are you able to explain that a little bit more? So like how, how would you um, use an ice shape model or how would you design a, an ice shape modeling experiment, say of a, like say weights or something that's rapidly retreating um, to determine where best to take measurements of ice thickness or mass loss? Yeah, it, it involves, uh, you can still hear me, right? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it involves uh, defining a metric that quantifies some information. And then you try to maximize this metric. For example, the metric could be uh, where to place the sensor. So you try to maximize the metric on the spatial space and try to find uh, what particular spatial location maximizes that metric. And the metric generally involves some kind of KL divergence in the Bayesian sense. It is like a probability metric. Um, and then you try to maximize it. I can uh, elaborate better offline, I would think. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm really interested just like, um, particularly like in predicting say grounding line retreat and the probability that it would stabilize on bedrock highs, for example, versus um, retreat rapidly and then whether or not you could use this for yeah better like better placement of instruments for, for that kind of a application that's really yeah cool. I haven't particularly Thank thought you. of those ones but uh perhaps yeah perhaps it could be done by 
framing the problem in a different manner than I'm used to seeing, but I've never thought okay. about those problems. Yeah, well, I'd be interested. Maybe I'll send you an email later. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shriyas. Thank you, Felicity. Uh, any other questions? Okay, then we'll move to the next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Jared Magia. He will give us a talk about modeling water-induced glacier seismic signals with hydrodynamic simulations. Jared, it's all yours now. Thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen. I can't seem to start my camera either. So we'll just go with the PowerPoint. Yeah, I can see your screen now. Uh, it's in. Oh, sorry. It's... Yeah, just one moment. Is... Jared, you can try once for switching on the camera. Here we go. There we go. Yeah, it's good. All good now. Thank you. Um, alrighty. So, thank you. My name is Jared Magia, and I am a first year PhD candidate at the University of Tasmania. And um, I'm going to be talking about my work in modelling the seismic signals generated by moving glacier meltwater. Um, so this present presentation will largely be a plan of some work that we're doing through this project, as well as some preliminary results. So as many problems in polar science, it's a very interdisciplinary task. So it crosses over many boundaries, including uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, hydrology, glaciology, seismology. Um, so as such, we've assembled an interdis interdisciplinary team to work on it. Um, so to provide some motivation for this work, um, so we're looking at monitoring glacier hydrology. So water moves across, through and under glaciers through interconnected systems. And some, certainly not all, but some of this meltwater movement has the potential to produce seismic signals. So that opens a sort of window of opportunity for us to observe some of the hidden processes. So it's a very, seismology can be a very complementary method to other approaches such as satellite uh, observation. Um, so in terms of its relevance to ice sheet dynamics and ice sheet mass balance, so we have, if we have rapid injections of water to the interface between the ice and a rock, we can have accelerated basal motion, whether this be on a, on a hard bed due to a reduction in effective pressure or otherwise due to enhanced till deformation. Um, so we already see some of this in Greenland where we have uh, enhanced melting in the summer, draining to the base of the glacier, and therefore um, this has been suspected to increase uh, glacier motion during summer months. And in Antarctica, we don't have as widespread connections between the surface and the base of a glacier, but we do have the importance of subglacial hydrology, whether this be due to, say, subglacial lake drainage. And this is also um, not even mentioning the effects of superglacial hydrology on uh, hydrofracturing and ice shelf collapse. So all in all, we have um, quite an importance on glacier hydrology for ice sheet dynamics. So as a bit of an outline for what we're looking to do in this project. So um, the main goal is to be able to aid in the interpretation of seismic signals that are generated by moving meltwater. So there's two key parts to this. So we first have a modelling approach where we want to identify the signals that are generated by moving meltwater and be able to verify those with um, observed signals. And then secondly, be able to classify and group uh, recorded signals according to the generative process. So being able to identify which hydrological events of importance have occurred from the seismic record. 
Um, so the way that we've set up a model to do this is really the coupling of two distinct models. So we have a fluid model, which we use to model the movement of meltwater through different glacier geometries of interest. And then we uh, feed that into a wave propagation simulation. So to get from the forces of the fluid on the boundary, so on the rock and the ice, then generate waveforms synthetically. It can be somewhat considered as like a numerical equivalent to like a flume experiment. So we set up some uh, geometry that we're going to run our water through. We set up initial conditions for the water. We simulate it and then we just pick up um, the combination of all the different processes going on. So it may be fluid impacting against boundaries. There may be um, internal pressure waves within the fluid. There may be turbulence, all sorts of things that all get picked up together in our waveforms. So the particular fluid model that we are using at present is called smooth particle hydrodynamics or SPH. And rather than being a grid-based um, fluid dynamics model, it instead has particles which move through the simulation and carry fluid properties with them. Um, so I've got a little example video here of just a simple dam break uh, with SPH simulation. So we can see we start with um, fluid on the left-hand side and then we run that through and we get these quite realistic splashing and sloshing effects. So the particular form of SPH that we're using is called weakly compressible SPH. And that's because it's uh, purposely designed for water flows and it handles um, water fluid boundaries quite nicely. So, the idea here is that we have a momentum equation, which we use to update the velocity of each particle. We have a continuity equation to update their density. And then we have an equation of state, which links the density back to the pressure. So we compute this for each of our particles. And then at each time step, we move our particles using the velocity vector to a new position for the next time step. Um, without going into tremendous detail of the ins and outs of how SPH works. The idea is that we go, we're going to need gradients of the pressure and velocity to be able to solve the continuity and momentum equations, but we don't have a regular grid to be able to use finite differencing on. So what we define instead is a smoothing kernel, which we denote W here. And the point of the smoothing kernel is that we can interpolate to any point within our domain using a weighted average of surrounding particles. And those weights are given by the kernel and are dependent on how far apart the particles are. Using that smoothing kernel, we can then also define a gradient operator. So we can convert our, or dis discretize our um, momentum and continuity equations for some particle indexed I into a weighted sum over its neighboring particles J. So we only need to consider the neighboring particles J, which are within some radius of the particle that we're interested in. So we can compute this then for each particle. And from the momentum equation, we can also pull out the forces exerted by some particular particle J's and separate that into pressure and viscous forces, which will be important later for working out the force of the fluid on the solid. So that's in essence how we run our fluid simulation. But what we're interested in from a seismology perspective is the force that the fluid imparts on the solid boundaries. So to work that out, there's a couple of different ways we could do this. Firstly, we could look at individual impacts of fluid particles upon the boundary. Each of those produce a seismic signal. And then our final result will be the superposition of those signals. We can alternatively look at a pure SPH method, which would be where to solve the momentum equation for each fluid particle, we had to work out the force of the solid on the fluid. Now, seeing as we've already calculated that, we can just use the equal and opposite force of the fluid back on the solid, which we can then use to work out our forces. So out of our SPH simulation, what we really need is these forces against forces of the fluid against our solid boundaries. So the next step is then to be able to convert this into waveforms. So it's a lot more complex of a process than would be indicated by this one box down the bottom, but essentially what we're considering at the moment is the propagation of P and S waves. 
And we're doing this in the frequency domain where we deal with attenuation and dispersion of the wave packet. And we also account for geometric spreading of the, of the wavefront. So as a simple example of this in action and a bit of an illustration of the types of things we can see. Um, so on the left-hand side here, I've set up a set of uh, channel-like geometry. So this may be a supraglacial and partially filled end glacial channel. And they've got different types of bends in them. So we've got a 45 degree bend, a 90 degree bend, and then a couple of S-shaped S bends. And we start our water at, at the left-hand side here, and it flows through to the right um, using the SPH model. We then work out the forces using the particle impact method, and we can then convert those into seismic uh, waveforms. So here I've got the acceleration in the X component at a seismograph um, located uh, about 10 meters away from the um, impacts. Now, the idea of where we're going from here is we would like to be able to characterize these types of signals and work out which ones and what characteristics we should expect from glacier geometries of interest, and then um, be able to classify uh, real signals using some of these characteristics. So it's important to note that we're not trying to model exact waveforms here. It's a slightly simplified model where we're just trying to capture the general character of these waveforms which are hopefully indicative of the processes of interest. So that leads into the further work. So the main immediate work we're looking to do is explore a greater range of geometries. So some of interest would be, for example, the movement of water from the surface into end glacial channels or moons, um, and being able to see what characteristics we'd expect from those types of events. Another thing we may look to doing is um, increasing some of the complexity in the model. So looking at perhaps surface seismic waves as well, looking at the coupling of the fluid and its solid boundaries by accounting for some elasticity, which can allow uh, resonant fluid waves. And also perhaps looking at anisotropy of the ice itself. Now, the long-term key goal of this is to be able to pair it with unsupervised learning algorithms. So the idea there would be, would cluster seismic signals into groups of common characteristics and then perhaps be able to match some of those groups to uh, signals that we have modeled that match with glacier hydrology events of interest. So as you can see um, this work is still certainly in its uh, formative stages so please do feel free to get in touch with me. My email is in the bottom right hand corner if you have any any feedback or any ideas or any questions about it uh, beyond the session. But other than that, I thank you all for listening. Thank you, Jared. That's a very nice talk. Do we have any questions for Jared? Feel free just to drop your questions in the Q&A box. Any questions? Otherwise, we'll move to the our next speaker. Thanks again, Jared. Our next speaker is Suranja uh, Adhikari. He will give us a talk about on the attribution of ice thickness change to sea level change. Suranja, it's all yours now. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect, let me share my screen. I can see your screen now. That sounds That's awesome, me. give me a second. Okay, cool. I'm not an active sim user, I'm trying to hide this. Okay, I think it should be fine. Cool, so can you, okay, can you see it all right now, right? Yeah, I can see it well. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, although it would have been nicer to see people in person, but you know, that's how it is uh, for now. So my name is Surendra Adhikari. I work at Jet Proportion Laboratory. And in this presentation, I'm gonna talk about how to attribute ice thickness change to sea level change. So on the, on the face of it, 
this, this problem looks very simple and it's a forward bookkeeping task. But when we consider an evolving system of solid earth, ice sheet and sea level, then it throws out a number of complexities. And I'm gonna introduce some of those and I'll try and propose a solution as to how to deal with those. So one fundamental concept that is uh, important here is what, it, what is called the ice height of application. And, and by the way, all this complexity that I was talking about mostly applied to the marine ice sheet, uh, and which is uh, obvious. But here, as you can see, this is marine ice sheet represented here as a column of ice. And next to it is ocean. So you can see relative sea level. And there is a because of the difference in ice density and ocean water density. So there is a certain flotation height, the dashed line here. And ice thickness above the flotation height, F, is what is called ice height of flotation or simply height of flotation. And by definition for floating ice, height of flotation is zero. And imagine ice sheet has evolved from this geometry to the one in the right hand side. Then the contribution of this ice column to the sea level can be computed by differentiating the ice height of flotation. So basically delta F, <clears throat> not, not the change in ice thickness, delta H. And this looks all good and it works perfectly fine, you know, if things are much simpler. By, <clears throat> by much simpler, I mean, if we only consider a standalone ice sheet model. Okay, so there are, you know, if we use the, if we extend the same, what I call the height of a flotation based classical methods of estimating ice thickness change, ice thickness attribution to the sea level change, uh, it's not gonna work all the time, uh, especially when there is, some perturbation in the relative sea level. So it could be because of the subsidence or uplift of local bed, or it could be because of the excess amount of uh, sea level rise coming from the far field ice sheet. So again, one example here. So this is one configuration in a given time snap T. So you could see ocean, ice column, and this is the height of a flotation. And so something happened uh, in the Earth system and it causes the local sea level to drop even though ice thickness for this column remains as is. And as you could see, because of the drop in relative sea level, then the, the, there is increase in height of a flotation in time T plus delta T. And if you differentiate the two and based on this height of a flotation method, then you are going to get some positive contribution. You, you can get some positive value for the change in height of a flotation, which implies unfortunately falsely that there must be a sea level drop associated with the chain associated with the, the this particular ice column, which is not true. Another example. So when instead of dropping sea level, if something happened to the earth system and the sea level rises, we even and, and there is again no change in ice height, no change in ice height between the two time snaps. And you can see because of this excess amount of ocean water, then it reaches buoyancy and then ice column starts floating. In this case, generally correctly, this, this method implies that the sea level rise, there will be sea level rise because of the size column. But there are some caveats, but let's not get into detail for now. And apart from these and other kind of complications that the existing height of a flotation based method cannot capture, there, there is one another important um, element that is mostly overlooked, which is related to the, the fact that the freshwater density is different from the ocean water density. So in general, so here is a simple example. It also applies to sea ice. So this is this is some floating, happily floating ice of thickness delta H. If it melts instantaneously, it produces the fresh water, which has a density, which has slightly larger volume than the ocean water upon which ice floats. So basically the has portion of the fresh water should be distributed across the ocean area. And in this particular case, it is always true that the melting of floating ice contributes to sea level rise. So our goal here is to come up with a unified mathematical formalism that could be used to compute sea level contribution of evolving ice sheets uh, in an evolving system of ice sheets, solid earth, and uh, uh, ocean. And you know the, the ice sheets, solid earth, and ocean geometries could be caused by any geophysical process. And it's, it, it applies uh, for it applies across time scales. So it, it's not a dynamics problem. It is 
it, it is purely a kinematic analysis. And this method has been published uh, a couple of years back uh, uh, in, in the cryosphere. And here you can see, you know, some sort of uh, how we try and represent uh, real Earth scenario in, in our simplistic formulation. Formalism, as you can see, the continent shown in hast here, and the, the bluish shade shows uh, ice sheets, and you could have the grounded ice and floating ice, and a bunch of lakes, proglacial, subglacial, and superglacial, and a white ocean, by the way. Okay, so without getting into the, the, the mathematical details, I let me try my best to try and explain how and why we should handle this problem of computing, of, of, of estimating basically, uh, of deriving, I'd say, the new, new field for estimating sea level contribution. So here you can see in dust, a ice sheet, marine ice sheet, sea level should be somewhere here. This is a bedrock flowing from left to right. And after a certain time, it has reached the new geometry, the solid line here. And we found it convenient that this, this new field that we are trying to derive should be split into two parts. The one is related to one is related to the fact that this component contributes to the mass change of the ocean. While the second component, second element only contributes to sea level rise by changing the ocean volume. And it is important because this component is responsible for what is called uh, driving the GRD model, which is essentially uh, the, the gravitational, deformational, and uh, rotational response of solid earth to ice ocean mass exchange. And it, it is also usually called sea level fingerprint model or GIA model, if you may. And the, the, the first component, the mass related component, can be simply expressed as in here. And as you could see, the Z1 and Z2 basically are the grounded ice mask at time one and time two, basically. So in this case, when both ice sheets, I mean, at both times, when the ice sheet is grounded, which is in this regime, so it takes a value of one. And if we are in this, this regime, then delta H contributes to sea level. I call it regime one. And elsewhere, where this it takes value of zero, then the change in height of a flotation contributes to sea level. And, 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 and this, this part is also, I mean, we can also divide it into two parts because part B is where, uh, the same B is where the grounded ice has now floated or the reverse might, might happen. And the, the same C is where the floating ice remains floating. So in the same C by definition, delta F, the change in ice height of, ice height of a flotation is zero. So there's no mass contribution from the same C. So it's just to generalize things but but it, it captures uh, the, the, the essence of uh, the mass attribution. And as for the volume component, uh, it looks slightly uh, complicated, but not, it's not really uh, so complicated. So you could see, again, it is only applied to regime B and C. And for regime C, again, because delta F vanishes, the all of change in ice thickness contributes to ocean volume change. So think of sea ice melting. And for regime B, depending upon uh, if there is excess ice thickness change compared to the, 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 the change in flotation height, then there is some contribution from this, this regime to sea level change via ocean volume change. So let's have a quick look at uh, uh, an example, like, you know, uh, how, how much, yeah, quick look at uh, of an example. So again, here is, is a purely synthetic experiment, kinematic analysis, no model simulation, nothing. The blue shows the initial geometry, ice surface, bed is down here, and it has started floating here. And after a certain time, it doesn't matter what time, uh, glacier or ice sheet takes a new geometry shown here with red. They see the surface and they see the bed. So there are two input that I have put in here. So one from time one to time two, I set thinned by 400 meter uniformly. And also I have allowed the bedrock to lower by 100 meter. It's just arbitrary input. In this case, so of course, the ice thickness change at prescribed is 400 meter as a function of distance, and it can compute the change in ice height of ice height of flotation. And here, so the two components that contribute to sea level uh, uh, field uh, is mass and volume related again. So mass related uh, uh, element is shown here with the orange shade here, and the volume relevant uh, related element is shown with the hash line here. So in regime one, it's all straightforward, it's delta H, the change in ice thickness that contributes to sea level. 
And so the, this is all because of the, sorry, in, in regime C, it's all because of the melting of the floating ice, just like sea ice condition. And in between, things are a bit complicated. Again, I won't have time to go into uh, much detail, but specifically in this particular region, what you see here, uh, okay, so I am running out of time. So basically there are two regimes. So one is, you know, if the change in ice thickness dictate the change in height of a flotation, then the amplitude of change in ice thickness should be larger than the amplitude of change in height of a flotation. And in this case, you always get, you know, you are in this particular regime. And in certain cases, the change in relative sea level can dominate the change in height of a flotation, and then you get some, uh, you know, solution in, in the other side of the red line here. And the difference between the two here is that, going from here to here, you see the change in ice thickness, which is, which produces fresh water. But here, even though ice has floated, there is ice has not actually melted. So you don't have to apply for this, uh, uh, this fresh water uh, and ocean water related uh, correction there. But anyway, and then basically the, the final solution is the sum of the two, which is red line here. And the black one is the mass component, which dominates in this case. And the, the blue line here is just to show you the characteristic of this volume component, which is amplified by effectivity. So how much improvements are we really talking here? So this is based on a real simulation uh, by uh, our uh, team here. Uh, the paper came out in 2019. It was based on a high resolution, high order ice sheet model, and to ice sheet model, which was coupled with high resolution global GIA model. And what you see here is the change in ice thickness uh, between year 2350 and present day, uh, towards glacier, pine and glacier, you can see. And this is the new field that we propose here, which should be the, 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 the yeah, if you, if you do a special integration of this field, this should give you the correct amount of sea level contribution from this ice sheet. And here, uh, okay, Shane, I am taking a couple more minutes if you don't mind. Uh, so sorry about that. And almost done, this is my second last slide. And, and this is the similar map you could get using the, the existing method and, and the difference is shown here. And again, you know, without uh, further wasting my time, so you could say the function of time, ice volume change, the old method gives orange line, the new method gives blue line. So in terms of percentage, you could see on, you know, on an average throughout the 500 years of simulation, we find that the new method is about 10 to 15% of more silver contribution throughout the simulation period. And the mass component alone looks more, uh, more or less stable at 5% level. And this is my very last slide. So this, this is it's related to this problem, but I mean, the key here, as you can see, obviously, is that, so we, we propose the community to adopt this method so we can better uh, estimate the sea level contribution from the ice sheet. Uh, the more I look at, think, think of this problem, and um, the more loopholes I, I have found. So the one potential uh, le, le important loophole is that, so to me, it seems like I should contribution to sea level change appears to be path dependent metric, which is problematic. Uh, let me just tell you in a minute, and I will stop. So without a uh, uh, loss of generality, let's assume the ice density, ocean water, and fresh water density are same. And here is one configuration of the system, ice, ocean, ice height of flotation, you know, given this assumption. And after a certain time, they, it, it appears, it, 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 it gets the second configuration like this. And we have the exact same ice thickness here, but the only change that's happening here is the bedrock has moved up. And going from left-hand side to right-hand side uh, uh, configuration, scenario is one to two, then change in ocean volume, not, nothing, change in sea level, nothing. But what happened, this configuration has gone through a particular route so that ice sheet has completely melted in the, in the, in the meantime, I mean, in, in between the two time snaps. And then you have to take care of what happens when ice goes from in the scenario one to mid state here, and then mid state to state two. And then you can compute the change in ocean volume and which should be the same as the change in ocean volume. So this is a conservative metric and mass conservation principle, perfectly fine. But for the sea level chain, so you find that, you know, only when F1 and F2, F1 and F2 are same, then the change in sea level appears to be a conservative metric, but it does not have to be because there could be some perturbation at bed or anything. And F2 does not have to be equal to F1 in, 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 in multiple situations, especially in the marine portion of the Antarctic ice sheet. And that's where the, it is really important that we have to capture a particular path that a glacier or ice sheet takes 
to go from a initial state to final state. And we have to do the bookkeeping as, 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 as uh, uh, um, accurately as possible. And this is something I have never thought about it because I, or in general, we used to assume that senior C-level contribution is also a conservative matrix, meaning no matter which path you take, so you end up with the same number, which appears to be not to be the case. And which, if, if this is true, and this is still, I'm investigating further uh, on this along the line, so we should be extremely careful in glaciological data model and comparison. And with this, I will stop talking, and I apologize for taking a couple more minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Surendra. It's a really nice talk. Uh, sorry, we don't have time for questions, but we will have um, time at the end of this session for questions for Surendra. Please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A. And sorry, our thank next you. speaker, thank you. Our next speaker is Craig Stevens. Uh, unfortunately, he's not here in person, but he has a recording for us. And he will talk about mixing and transport in a subglacial coastal cavity observations from the Camp Astream grounding zone. Uh, the IT team, could you please? Yeah, thank you. I, I can't hear it. No, still there, there's no. As well as Cornell. Okay, thanks for coming along to my talk. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some hydrographic observations um, beneath uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet right on the margin of the Ross Ice Shelf. It's a place called the um, CAM ice stream. And so this is um, work funded by the New Zealand Antarctic Science Platform, and we've got collaborators from around New Zealand as well as Cornell in the US. Um, so it's some observations part of a sequence of um, uh, stations we've occupied over the last decade where we've been trying to build up um, some sort of process and time series awareness. And this is extended from the continental shelf break um, through to coastal collinear um, and ice shelf frontal regions, as well as the, the central um, circulation within the Ross Ice Shelf, and then the station that I'm going to talk about today, uh, which is at the grounding line, some sort of thousand kilometres from uh, Scott Base and McMurdo Station. Um, so, so the location we're looking at, at the Cam Ice Stream, is an arrested ice stream. Uh, and hence the interest is, you know, with a warming ocean, will this help free up um, something that will increase drainage from East Antarctica? Um, Scott Base and McMurdo Station are here in the, the bottom right. Um, and then if we, if we zoom in, um, we occupied uh, sort of a normal grounding line station um, two and a half years ago. Uh, and then this most recent season, we're actually on the, the coastal margin at a place called KISS 2. Um, and so this is so dramatically exaggerated vertical extent here, but it's a, it's a known drainage channel um, beneath the Cam Ice Stream um, draining into the, um, let's see, the western margin of the, the Ross Ice Shelf. And I guess going into this, you know, we had a, a nicely uh, detected from surface geophysics and satellite, um, a nice regular uh, smoothly varying depression. Um, and so we're sort of anticipating um, beneath that would be a nice um, uh, channel mirroring that depression. And so you'd have um, uh, an estuarine flow, if you like, with, with meltwater and subglacial discharge coming out of the surface and being replaced by ocean water at the, the base. Um, and of course, the way of things we can we can park that and, and we'll update we'll update what we actually saw. Um, so uh, we maintained um, an open borehole for about ten days, um, and so this is uh, thanks to um, 
Victoria University drilling team um, led by Darcy Mandino um, using a bass design. And so they were able to keep a 25 to 30 centimeter diameter hole open for all that time, um, which, which makes observation really um, quite achievable. And so um, lowering equipment uh, down in one location, um, we're just looking upwards just as we exit the hole. Um, and so looking back up, that's probably about a, a 50 centimeter hole by the time we get to the bottom. Uh, and so we lowered a sequence of instruments over the, the subsequent 10 days. Um, so, so the first thing, uh, you know, I made the point earlier that the, the cavity wasn't the nice smoothly arranged channel. Um, uh, and so we lowered a sideways or oblique looking altimeter. Um, and we just sort of got a rotating perspective here and, and note that this is a one-to-one -one in terms of horizontal and vertical. So it's really, um, so it's about 200 meters in the vertical and, and really less than a hundred meters in the horizontal. Uh, and a little bit of a keyhole with sort of a bulge at the surface uh, and the upper side, um, and then this narrow slot. Um, so camera looking sideways just beneath the ice um, underside. And so a number of things to see. So the undulations you're looking at are order of one meter. And we've got that from um, other, other video observations that have enabled that sort of scale registration. Um, and, and so a number of things to note, you know, it's certainly not flat either at the macro or the, the local scale. Um, there are also in places you can see specular reflection. So there must be some sort of crystals or refreezing going on. And you also pl see plenty of sediment raining out. So, so if, you, if you're going to apply the um, ice melt rate equations, um, they're going to be challenged. Um, then looking the other direction, uh, apologies for the focus. Um, we're looking downwards just above the seabed. The two orange dots are 100 millimeters apart. Um, and it's a flat sediment uh, laden layer, at least flat in the, the scale of, of centimeters, um, but are also um, pretty active ecosystem. Although I will say that a repeated camera work would find very varying levels. In this case, it's, it's inundated. We're inundated with amphipods. So um, small sort of shrimpy like things um, and heaps of them. So, so clearly there's some nutrients getting into the system to support that. Um, all of those observations are in one location. Um, we were fortunate enough to have the Cornell um, Icefin team with their uh, ROV designed to go down these sorts of boreholes. And so this was able to map upstream um, order of about 600 um, meters and, and just show that, that whilst we had a, a nice flat sort of sediment layer directly beneath our borehole, um, there's, there was plenty of topographic variation and sort of channelization upstream. So, so it, it has in many ways lots in common with what you might see in a stream bed in, a, in lower latitudes without 500 meters of ice above it. And so looking at CTD data, so water column hydrographic structure, um, definitely stratified. Um, uh, and so you can sort of pull out a few layers if you like. And so um, seeing sort of a, a meltwater layer on the upper side with the, the lowest um, salinity. And so we're looking at purple is uh, salinity, uh, black is temperature and orange is a turbidity measure. Uh, so there's a, a meltwater layer at the top. And so this is it's sort of the top of that bulge that we saw in the altimeter data. And then there's what we're, we're describing as a subglacial discharge, it has elevated turbidity and it has all the hallmarks of an interflow where you've got some sort of um, neutrally buoyant flow squeezing between um, uh, uh, density um, boundaries in a, in a continuously stratified water column. Then beneath that, there's sort of three layers that we're, we're sort of seeing as um, uh, sort of meltwater influence greater or lesser extent inflow from the uh, open cavity. So, so not actually open to the ocean, but the, the wider Ross ice shelf cavity. And so, so there's a nice sort of uh, meltwater line there, but then we've clearly um, slotting in some different uh, temperature and salinity drivers um, for, the, for the rest of the water column. Um, and it's certainly not static. This is a 24 hour 
um, sequence of temperature profiles. And so, you know, the structure is bouncing up and down by a uh, order of 40 to 50 meters. And of course, the barotropic tide is only around a meter. So, so clearly there's a baroclinic response here where, where um, things uh, can get driven, um, but then um, oscillate, uh, at least in some kind of damped way. Uh, and also there's there's evidence of uh, overturns and stuff so so the the structure is certainly causing mixing as well um, we left a, a hydrographic mooring that was logging temperatures um, backscatter and velocities for the subsequent um, period of time um, and so uh, first off keep in mind um, that uh, this is all flipped and so the surface temperature is the coldest and they're sitting down the bottom. So this is the surface layer. Um, and then the, the, the bed layers are up the top here. Um, things to see, the, the surface layer is reasonably consistent with only occasional blips uh, where there must be some sort of pulse um, of water coming through. Um, there's clearly uh, a spring neap cycle. So around two weeks, um, with some modulating the, the variability as we saw in the previous slide. Um, but the, the biggest signal perhaps is this um, set of sensors that are intermediate in the, the interflow layer. And because they're sitting in a, in a nose in the temperature, as, as with some sort of slow change in the water column structure, our temperature sensor moves from something closer to the surface layer structure to being closer to the, um, the sort of the background ambient layers beneath. And so I guess what remains to be seen is whether this is some sort of annual cycle or we're on some sort of slowly varying sort of one-way street here. So, so we'll hope, hopefully our instruments will, will carry on um, telemetry data back. Uh, so this is our sort of general setup. Um, where we're assuming that we've got some sort of subglacial discharge coming into the system, floating out at mid-depth. There's some, some meltwater pooling up from various sources. This would be coming along the channel, but also up the sidewalls. And all this uh, is being replaced from the, the cavity proper, but at the bottom and, and in, into some layers um, beneath at, at a much slower rate. Um, and I guess the only other point to make is um, a few days after we installed the mooring, um, the Tongan eruption uh, and subsequent tsunami um, manifest themselves in our record. So, so we have an eruption here and um, uh, a little over half a day later, um, we see uh, quite a strong um, signal in our um, pressure uh, gradient time, um, our, our high pass pressure, if you like. Uh, I guess the interesting thing is that this um, ca carries on ringing um, for several days. It con continues on past the end of this record here. Um, and so that tells us something about how uh, the, the entire Ross ice shelf cavity um, responded to, to that large scale perturbation. So it's clearly still a work in progress. Um, so just to summarize, um, uh, this um, channel and the side of, a, of an ice shelf cavity is certainly, um, it's not some sort of smooth um, inlet, it's uh, a keyhole-like and the melt rate is clearly responding to the water column structure, at least at the time we we're observing. Um, but that water in the channel is mainly seawater um, with the modest um, melt or subglacial contribution. Um, uh, and so consequently, the melt is not straightforward, um, both in terms of it, um, uh, the sort of the direction, whether it's flowing up the side walls or coming along the main channel, but also the underside of the ice is, is highly varied in sort of topography. And so um, melt rate equations will be challenging. Um, Baroclinicity, um, the stratification in the cavity uh, certainly responds to tides and, and tsunami, as we saw. Um, and there's, there's plenty of backscatter material in the water column, lots of sediment um, and, and uh, as quite an ecosystem signature. Um, so I'll leave it there and thanks for listening. Thank you, uh, it's a great talk. And if you have any questions for Craig, please drop email to him. Our next speaker is uh, from 
Xue Yuan Tang, he will give us a talk about a deep learning model to extract bedrock and internal layers from radio echo sounding imaging of ice sheets. Xue Yuan, it's all yours now. I can see your screen now. I, I can't hear you. I was talking. Yeah, great. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, sorry. I... Can you hear me? I, I, I hear. I, I, I can't, uh, a, a full screen. You can play it in the... Um, try Fang in. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that one. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh... It's not Good working, morning. just that one. Yes. yes, great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Xuan Tang uh, from the Polar Research Institute of China. Thanks to our star session for giving me a chance to excuse our ice exchange model as that. Now, uh, we have a... Uh, Two scars, uh, scientific uh, actions, uh, for example, one and uh, it captures uh, a two development, uh, a continent wide, a depth model of ice Antarctic ice sheet using in the interlow and uh, in the surface imagined by radar data. And another is uh, the ranges. The, its goal is to find the knowledge gap to add to the add to the ice sheet margin. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, we have, uh, 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 you know, uh, we have uh, uh, used the, the, the radar to uh, little that in the imagery. Uh, of the ice sheet, we can obtain two basic or magical uh, features uh, in the oil and yes, in the, the bedrock uh, topography. And uh, we use uh, we use the, uh, the ice layers. Uh, we <coughs> we can find, find the the, uh, the the ice sheet structure. Uh, for example, ice divide and uh, migration, and uh, uh, we use the data uh, to uh, generate it to, uh, the bed map two uh, or bed map three. Um, there, there, there are some tra traditional ways to pick the, the, these internal layers in the bedroom. Uh, such as uh, KSVD uh, with, uh, uh, this ways to uh, the the uh, the uh, in the in the uh, imagery. <clears throat> uh, currently, however, manual pick, uh, picking is uh, commonly used to extract the the, the, in the uh, adaptive ice. And like this, <clears throat> uh, on the Antarctic radar lines, the bedrock is mostly extracted by hand. The and the bars uh, and the RV radar lines results in recent decades uh, can be seen, uh, which is <clears throat> a lot uh, of. Uh, manpower and the time. Uh, there are currently only a few 
uh, artificial picking interior layers, like uh, winter 2019. Uh, recently, uh, we have a new about the coffee at the process and the best land or appeal. Uh, we listen to maps. Uh, it's also from a uh, manual manual peak peaking. Uh, um, <clears throat> recently, the machine learning metrics such as nouns, the deep bed map have been used to generate the higher resolution by the topography uh, of the Antarctic. Uh, I see it. <clears throat> now, uh, AM provides uh, a message to imagine a future, a future extraction. Uh, that vector such as unit can be used to pick the layers, but uh, the you don't only have uh, limitations, limitations like, uh, like uh, for precision subjective uh, layer selection or limitation of uh, training sets. Uh, <coughs> we think uh, the send that take radar data may be uh, effective for me to overcome uh, these uh, limitations uh, uh, like uh, the Deloitte, like uh, the uh, vertical strips and uh, hyperbolic like uh, fringes, uh, low frequency changes and on being Deloitte. Uh, to generate the uh, synthetic images, we need to consider noise and the uh, interface, including uh, low frequency changes, uh, radical steps, uh, and bit noise and uh, hyper hyperbolic uh, forms. Uh, uh, the synthetic reader like um, imaging uh, can be used to uh, generate the neighbors, uh, including the four uh, forms, uh, lois and uh, fringes. fringes. Uh, our ISNET is a uh, uh, model. Uh, it's a structure like this. Uh, it's, like, it's also have a two decoders for eyes and the barrel peak peaking. The the important input uh, of our model is uh, the read margin silence uh, slice, and uh, the output is. Uh, uh, prediction one type uh, is type of the ice layer, and the, and the prediction uh, the second type for bedrock uh, geometry. <coughs> uh, this is uh, the encoder and the decoder uh, structure for exchanging the uh, bedrock. Uh, the input in this uh, is a radar uh, imaging slides and uh, <coughs> uh, for, uh, from uh, by proceeding uh, uh, precision to uh, out, out, output uh, the the ice layers and uh, and uh, the bird lock uh, interface. <coughs> uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, the the uh, peak the ice alias uh, the uh, model structure uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 preceding uh, 
uh, uh, include to the uh, convolution layer and the max cooling layer and the pool for the uh, connected layer uh, and the uh, ops uh, sampling uh, layer and the transpose the con convolution layer and the skip for click uh, connection. Uh, the ice uh, the ice net uh, model uh, as training uh, method is uh, uh, the first uh, uh, step to uh, input uh, the sent big data set uh, at about uh, 2000 uh, uh, centimeter uh, thick uh, images and uh, uh, by the, uh, the the ice 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 layer chaining in the uh, uh, bare rock chaining, uh, and uh, uh, and then and we use the the, uh, the chaining uh, result to uh, apply uh, the the service load data. Uh, this is the result uh, the uh, the peak uh, to the the peaking uh, ice ice layers uh, we have a uh, uh, sexy uh, uh, to pick the um, the ice ice layers and uh, <coughs> we am uh, we have obtained uh, obtained uh, the the uh, interface uh, six successful to pick the Baroque uh, uh, interface uh, like, like this. Uh, uh, here is the largest scale of a solution data uh, imaging uh, to uh, apply the uh, isolate to pick the uh, the the uh, the imagine a silence. <clears throat> and this is the result of the largest scale application uh, from uh, this uh, this image from uh, uh, the the the, the Tome, uh, area uh, uh, in the in the east uh, uh, Antarctic uh, ice sheet. Uh, the largest lexis from the snares is a uh, rock. Here is a rock is uh, snares. Uh, the results uh, is published is published by the I I I E T G R S. Uh, uh, we. Uh, I think that the next uh, the applications uh, we have we have we want uh, to use the the, the, the model to uh, the geophysical data in the in the PL and the uh, to trace the uh, in uh, in glacier layers in the PL uh, contributing to star uh, and uh, architecture action and then the. Uh, instant or regions, and uh, we we have to uh, find the subglacial lakes and the subglacial water system, and uh, to a uh, geo depress course in the sub glaciers uh, uh, around the PEO. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Xu Yuan. Uh, if you have any questions for Xu Yuan, please drop your question in the Q&A session. And uh, otherwise, we'll move to our last speaker for today, and Tim Nash. Uh, unfortunately, he is not here in person, and we have a recording ready. Hello everyone and um, apologies for not being able to 
Hello everyone, and um, apologies for not being able to give this talk in person. You won't be able to ask questions, but certainly please email um, and get in touch. This talk's at the applied end of SCAR science. Um, it's looking at um, sea level rise and the Antarctic ice sheet contribution to sea level rise. I want to acknowledge my co-authors here. It's a very multidisciplinary team of geologists, paleoclimatologists, um, ice sheet modelers, geodetics experts, um, probabilistic sea level projections experts, as well as practitioners, um, social scientists, and people involved in adaptation, sea level adaptation research. So what I'm gonna talk about is a five year project that we have been involved in in New Zealand. Um, and I think it's a really nice example to show um, why, why incidentalism is important, what are the key priorities and uncertainties that we still need to resolve concerning the Antarctic ice sheet. And I think it gives that applied practitioner user perspective um, about how we can contribute. So I'm gonna talk about um, the ongoing issue with getting Antarctic ice sheet dynamics right and the mass balance contribution to New Zealand right, as well as local factors such as vertical land movement. So on that first topic, um, deep uncertainty and future sea level rise still remains an Antarctic problem. The IPCC acknowledged that again in their latest um, assessment report where they pre present a, a set of projections to 2100 and 2300 um, that are based on processes known with, with medium confidence or better. And this largely comes from the ISMIT community. Um, but for the first time, they put in a storyline that considers high-end sea level based on some limited knowledge of, from models and, and observations and data to suggest there are instabilities in the Antarctic ice sheet, and we've all talked about them and heard about them, the marine ice sheet instability, the marine ice cliff instability, and the hydrofracturing ice shelves, that if these stabilities play out at scale, um, could, in, could increase the rate of contribution of Antarctic ice mass to sea level rise such that the IPCC said in the summary for policymakers, two meters could not be ruled out by the end of the century and five meters by 2150. So these, um, the importance of these um, low confidence, potentially rapid processes that affect the dynamics of the Antarctic ice sheet are the focus of SCAR Instant. And Florence Coglioni, the co-chief of SCAR Instant, with some colleagues, um, we wrote a paper that really explains in more detail, and I recommend you go there to understand what the issues are um, and how an um, instant um, program is, with its partners is trying to um, contribute and get to grips with these, with these key priorities. So in a nutshell, this is really um, the science that um, people in the instant program are, are sort of involved with. And, the approach we're taking is a systems approach and how that couples the ocean and the atmosphere coupling to the ice sheet, the solid earth coupling to the ice sheet, and those processes and feedbacks that either accelerate the rate of mass loss or, or potentially reduce the rate of mass loss. And most, most instant researchers can find a home around one of these processes at different temporal and spatial scales in this left-hand diagram. Um, we are different from, we are working closely and collaborating with ISMIP and ISMIP 7 for the next IPCC report through the WCRP and CLIC. But this group is involved with, with an ensemble approach to ice sheet modeling, both Greenland and Antarctica, that includes models that incorporate processes known with medium confidences. We want to figure out how important these low confidence processes are, how widespread they are, do they matter? And if so, can they be, should they be, can we know them with more confidence so that they can be incorporated into these models? And important, the feedbacks. And most feedbacks, as we're finding out, are, are not good news and, they, and things um, happen faster due to positive feedbacks. But negative feedbacks also occur and there's some really interesting cutting edge research coming out of this Palsy Grove and out of, the, out of theme two of instant that are looking at the effect of a retreating ice sheet on the bedrock underneath and the glacial isostatic rebound that can actually stabilize that retreat, slow it down. And so these processes are now being incorporated into models doing future projections. There are other positive processes as well that I've just listed here. They're obviously the freshwater melt as you melt an ice sheet, 
you, um, the freshwater cap that goes on the ocean can enhance the advection of warm deep water into the cavities melting the ice sheet. So this is our wheelhouse. This is the instant focus for the next um, six or six odd years. But the other thing that um, makes sea level rise and ice sheet um, dynamics uncertain is the scenario dependence. And depending on where we land with uh, stabilization of global warming, um, we may um, see quite a different future, particularly over centuries into the future. A number of nice studies have pointed this out, that there's a threshold in the system that if we stay under a certain level of warming, we might limit the amount of Antarctic ice melt, and or we might, uh, if we go over that threshold, through that threshold, then we may be committed to multi-meter sea level rise for generations to come. And just how that evolves, when we see that divergence, how much time we have is scenario dependent and depends on the mitigation of, of nations. Okay, so, what I'm going to start talking about now is from a practitioner's perspective. If you're working in coastal zone management, sea level um, prediction and adaptation to sea level hazards, um, there are certain things you want the science to do a better job of. And we've consulted the practitioner community. This was done at the World Climate Research Program, most a sea level conference most recently in Singapore, where the, protect, where the practitioner said, if we look at all the contributions to working out relative sea level, we need to know how important this high end sea level is. Do we use low confidence processes or medium confidence processes? So that, that's a challenge to the Antarctic community to get these ice sheet models incorporating the processes that are important in the physics around them. They also need regionalized information and local factors matter, such as vertical land movement, whether that's through subsidence or through tectonics, which can offset the effect of sea level rise or increase the rate of sea level rise. So just briefly on local factors, and it'll become apparent why this is relevant to Antarctica soon, um, but significant contribution to relative sea level rise is coming from urbanization and groundwater extraction. Cities like parts of Tokyo have subsided by four meters. Here's an example from California, where there's been one and a half meters of subsidence due to groundwater extraction. If you live on an active plate boundary, then the land could be going up and the land could be going down, both through earthquakes and on the long term, and that will significantly affect the sea level rise you feel locally. If you live in the near field of the ice sheets and you're building a base such as New Zealand is, then you're concerned about the near field effects, such as gravitational influence, and the fact that sea level could even fall if the West Antarctic ice sheet melts rapidly due to gravitational processes. And in some places, the land will rise or sink due to the isostatic rebound that I, that I talked about earlier. So uplift can directly increase um, or decrease the amount of sea level rise or really add to it. So I'm going to use the New Zealand case study. And New, and, and New Zealand's in a very similar situation to many places in the world. It has some guidance from government to local government and planners on, on what they should be preparing for. We only have a single set of sea level projections for the whole country for the different scenarios that has been updated recently to include the IPCC AR6 uh, numbers, as you can see here. But our government and our national guidance does not account for vertical land movements, yet we know for New Zealand, for 40% of New Zealand's coastline, vertical land movements matter. And in the background, are either going up or down in between earthquakes. So this has been a game changer. What we've done is we've utilized a really good national network of GNS, uh, GPS data, like just like Polnet has, but, but denser, of course, for New Zealand. Um, and we've filled the gaps between the sites of um, GPS receivers with satellite aperture radar data interferometry from Envisat and from the um, successor program, Sentinel, um, but we're using Envisat data in the, in the interim, and we're able to get really highly spatially resolved vertical land movements by calibrating the um, radar information from satellite with the land-based GPS, and we also have four long-term tide gauges. So to cut a long story short, this is the vertical deformation map for the whole of the New Zealand coastline. Every two kilometers, we have a um, measurement of the long-term rate of subsidence or uplift 
and a sea level projection that incorporates that. You can see um, that the square boxes are the GNSS sites that are used to calibrate the coastal river of INSAR data. So what you can see immediately is the lower North Island and the upper South Island are um, subsiding significantly and up to six millimetres per year, which more than doubles the global average of, of sea level rise. So this is um, particularly the case along this part of the, the coast of eastern New Zealand, southern New Zealand, our capital city, but also up in Auckland, our largest city that's being affected by land subsidence. So we developed a website for users, for stakeholders and planners. You can zoom in on any point, two kilometre space, you can click on it, you can get the range of sea level projections, 2100 out to 2300, both with vertical land movements included and without vertical land movements, which is what the old guidance gave. And you can see there's a significant difference if you include the rate of vertical land movement. And here's an example from Wellington, um, where this nuisance flooding is occurring more regularly. And we know that the threshold for Wellington is 30 centimeters of sea level rise. The 100 year coastal inundation event will be an annual event. And when you add in the relative sea level rise from vertical land movement, you see that that threshold has crossed 30 years earlier and could be as early as 2030. So this has really got our planners, our decision makers, our coastal infrastructure providers thinking very seriously that they must act now, there isn't much time. And internationally, this is where our science really helps around this adaptation um, decision making. So a lot of countries are engineering their, their way out of this by building walls, particularly rich countries. Singapore will do this, Manhattan Island will do this, parts of Japan are already doing it and for tsunami. But how high should that wall be? What should they be planning for? Um, how important are these low confidence processes from, from West Antarctica? There are many other places with much less adaptive capacity. They won't be building walls. Um, they're incredibly vulnerable and they want to know how long they have, how long can they stay, when will they have, have to move. So this is where the rubber hits the road and where um, the um, effect on Antarctica on a high, high end sea level future is, is very important. Now I just want to finish up um, by looking into the near field and some work we did for Antarctica New Zealand who are rebuilding the base on Ross Island. Um, and they wanted to make sure they stay out of the way of tsunami and particularly sea level rise. So we did use the uh, methodology, the AR6 methodology um, that I showed you before, all that flow diagrams. Um, we incorporated the vertical land movements from the tide gauge. And we made these projections and you can see it's wild. It could be as much as 60 centimetres sea level rise, or it might fall by as much as 50 centimetres due to the effect of gravitation um, in the near field. And also the, the dependence on GIA models, um, viscosity models, 3D versus 1D models. So this is complex. And of course, with a new base, you know, Antarctica and New Zealand were able to avoid any significant hazard by just building well above the modeled worst case scenario. So we are undertaking this now in a combination with SCAR and um, COMMAP sponsored to produce a report and paper for the treaty. We're using the PolNet data to get vertical land movements and we're going to produce um, a range of sea level projections for every Antarctic station, which is becoming really important around access to bases, shipping, um, tourism, et cetera. So I just want to finish up. I know I'm running out of time and I might have to leave this up here. Um, how can SCAR science best support the, the user community and the big urgent issues of our time? And some of these are outlined in the recent ACE report um, where there are strong research recommendations that are driven by the end user. The practitioners and communities have been consulted in the case of sea level rise and this is what they say. They need knowledge, they need um, adaptive capacity, they need collaboration and knowledge sharing from the scientific community. They need information that is downscaled to their area that takes into account factors such as vertical land movements. They need scientists to understand more than science, but the social issues um, and community values. But by the same token, they need to um, be upskilled and trained in why the science matters. They need early warning signals. They need signposts of imp imp impending 
tipping points and thresholds before it's too late. High-end uncertainty is definitely a concern, and this is where the Antarctic ice sheet process understanding needs to improve for the next IPCC report. Um, and at the end of the day, they need to know how to live with uncertainty, how to build it into risk and decision-making frameworks. And of course, we're all talking to each other from different backgrounds and different disciplines, and we need clear communication. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to Tim for this recorded talk. And that's all of our talks for today's session. And I'll say thank you again to all of our speakers. And if we we have plenty of time rest for this session. If we still have some questions for the speakers, yeah, feel free to drop in the QA. And at the same time, I want to remind everyone that we are going to have another uh half session happening on day seven there are going to be another great eight talks on that session I had a quick question, but I can't access the Q&A. Uh, I had a question for Surendra. If... Yeah, feel free to. Yeah. Uh, Surendra, could you pull up your slides once more? Uh, I wanted to ask about the B region. Yeah, let me do it real quick. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. My, I'm not sure if this is the correct question to ask, but if do the B region is not completely supported by the water, right? And we don't know yeah. how much of it is supported by water because we don't know the stress yeah. distribution at the boundaries with A and C. Okay. So, so reason B is basically, again, here we're looking at two snaps in time, right? So reason B is where the previously grounded ice, like this, the, the best one, right, had started floating. So this is the region, regime B. Or it could be the reverse, you know, like if, if you think the advancing case, the floating ice grounded, is, is grounded. So this is reason B. Reason A is where ice remains, the grounded ice remains grounded. And reason C is where floating ice remains floated. So B is the transition part, and, and this is where all the tricky, all the drama, you know, all those, uh, uh, you know, the, the exotic uh, phenomenon happens. Got it. And when when it starts floating, it is not that. So it is partially supported by region A and partially supported by the new water underneath now, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I mean, so now you are going into the dynamics of the system, right? I mean. Uh, what's the uh, uh, force balance and, and you know what makes a b and c intact so that's a whole separate question i think uh but here it, it is all kinematic you don't have to know what is supporting what all you have to know is ice is floating here simply because you know the ice thickness is not big enough large enough to get grounded so that's the only information you needed here got it got it got it yeah, this is not a dynamics case. I was thinking about, yeah, a different thing there. But thanks for clarifying that. Absolutely. Any other questions from the audience or the speakers? Otherwise, yeah, I'm very happy to congratulate all the speakers today. It's great talks. And uh, thanks again. And thanks to the audience too for these talks. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you next Tuesday, our second half hour session. Thanks again.
Yeah, and also uh, just a quick reminder that there's e-posters that, that you can um, have a look at associated with this session through the exhibition page on the website. Yeah, thanks Felicity. I think that's it, Felicity. That's all. Yep, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a shame. Um, shame we didn't we didn't get Craig or Tim to have some good questions there. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Thanks very much for that. Thank you, Felicity. Yeah. Will you be here for the second session uh, for next Tuesday? No, I don't think I'll. I think because it's. Yeah, it's what? too late for us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. see. And yeah, thanks. Make... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, thanks very much to the SCAR IT team, too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your support. Okay. I think, uh, oh. yeah. I'll head off. See you next time, Felicity. See ya. <laughs>